Hey, good morning. How's everybody doing? Good morning. Good. Awesome. Hey, we're going to go ahead and start with prayer and then we'll get started. So, Father, we just thank you for this morning. We just thank you for your word. We just thank you that, uh, that we get to study it and, and uh, apply it to our lives. Father, so we just bless this time and we just ask for your Holy Spirit just to come and just help us and lead us and guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, Jen. So, we're going to do uh, Colossians 3, and I'll be uh, teaching this class and the next class, and I'll actually teach you a chapter in one class. How's that sound? It's very exciting. Yes. Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, then I'll stick a little bit more to the text. Um, now, just before we get started, the, um, the, church, the church has never existed before, and so it's this new... It's not, it's not a new religion, it's a, it's a new way of life, and it's a new way of, of doing life. And so as you're, as you're reading this, Paul, in his heart, he was the father of many churches. He, he planted these churches, and while, typically like while he's in prison, all he is is, is praying for and interceding for and, and writing to. And, and he wants to see these churches thrive in this city. He wants to see the will of God done um, all throughout the, the world. And so... Colossians isn't just a, uh, a book, um, of course the Holy Spirit did right, but it's also a, a book from a father who wants to see his, his kids do well. And um, in chapter 3, you end up getting to the practical side of Christianity. Now before you ever get to the practical side of Christianity, you can't do anything um, apart from God, right? And we know that from Scripture. And I remember when I was younger in my faith, I used to just get to these type of things, like just God, just tell me what you require, just tell me what you do, what to do. But you can't do what he requires until you believe what he said in chapters 1 and 2. Does it make sense? Yes. To try to sit here and read chapter 3 and 4 without believing what was said in chapters 1 and 2 is impossible to do. Mm -hmm. Because Christ um, does expect us to do something, but he expects us to do it from faith. And the reason why Christ has such high standards is because it's really easy to hit those standards after you believe what he said. It's actually no problem whatsoever. The problem is, is that we don't believe what he said. We have a different sort of mindset. That's why he sent the Holy Spirit to help lead us and guide us, right? And you don't get led or guided by accident. You actually sit down with Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, lead me and guide me. Teach me, mold me. Um, as inadequate as you might feel in prayer, it's that place where he does something. And so prayer is kind of the secret to everything as far as um, understanding who God is. And it's not... How many of you consider yourselves really good prayer people? There we go. Go on. But, um, yeah, there, there, are, there isn't... It's not that people are professional uh, prayer people. It's that you get okay in the presence of God enough to sit and remain and believe that he's doing something, believing that it's a good use of your time. Believing even though you could be doing something and accomplishing something around the house or or something else that you would take the time that you have. How much free time does everybody have? Do you guys have a lot? No, I'm joking. <laughs> now, not many people do, right? Um, I'm hoping at a certain age you just get all this free time and retire. <laughs> and that eventually comes. But um, what you choose to do with your time when you get it is, is huge. But as we look at this first, first verse... If then you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. And you look at this, this word, and because you're required to zedio, and what zedio is, is to seek. Now, the Greek language is actually quite uh, s simpler and has less words in the English language. Okay, so we have a lot of words to describe a lot of things. They don't have a lot of words to describe a lot of things. They have some words, and they're used in almost all cases, right? So you look at this word, and this is the way we translate it. Deliberately, demanding, inquiring, looking for, make efforts, search, seek, sought, striving, try, try, trying, trying to obtain. So keep trying to obtain those things that are above. And I, I can't stress this enough. This is not a, um, oh, look what I bumped into accidentally kingdom. It's a ask, seek, and knock kingdom. Right, so you you will find what you're looking for, you will get what you're seeking, and you will receive what you're asking for. And oftentimes, a lot of people will say, "Well, I, I've asked for, I've been asking this for years." We don't just ask with our lips; we ask with our lives. 
right? If you look at your life, you can see what you're asking for. All right. I wrote some stuff down, but it only made sense then as I look at it. <laughs> oh, our, our duty is not ceremonial, but now relational. Our Lord and friend has now the highest seat of honor in the heavens. What I was simply meaning was, was that it's not, a, it's not your duty to seek the things that are above. It's now a privilege because now you actually can seek the things above. As before, you, the only way they, they, they sought the things above was pretty much in ceremonies and through certain rites. But now that you actually have been given the Spirit of God, and if you talk to uh, Alan Hawkins, he'll say the entire New Testament is based on the Holy Spirit. Let me rephrase that. That sounds really simple. Um, I don't mean that he wrote it. He did. What I'm saying is this, that the whole point of Jesus coming was so that you would receive the Spirit of God inside of you. And that that has never, that's what the prophets were talking about, and that was the promise. You know what I mean? We make the promise about um, going to heaven, and that's a benefit. But the whole, the whole point, he says, of Jesus Christ coming to die was so that you would receive the Holy Spirit, that you would live like God now that you have the Spirit of God. Set your mind on things above, this is verse 2, not on things that are on earth. And so this is a, this is a twofold, you, you push out earth, you pull in heaven. If Christ isn't in my earthly thought, the thought is out of bounds. What I mean by that is this. Um, as you move and live and breathe throughout your day, there, there are certain things that you can meditate on that are actually going to allow you to be more like him, okay? If you guys, anybody ever screw up? I can, if I were to cut open your thoughts and look at them, it's gonna be a very simple pattern of thinking that led you down that kind of way. And it's not gonna be thinking on heavenly things. It's gonna be thinking on things that, that are on earth. This morning, my, uh, my kids were um, scared to death. Brecken was scared to death all night. And, uh, Willow was having a party from 2 a.m. to 5 a.m. <laughs> in, her, in her crib. And um, there, there's a place to, to focus on that, but there's also a place to thank God for them. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I mean? Thanking God for them is in bounds. Sitting there and dwelling on how much sleep I didn't get is probably out of bounds. It's probably not going to bear any fruit, you know? And I still, I, I still dressed up for you, so. <laughs> You guys are like, he, does, he looked like he got plenty of sleep. I know. <laughs> it did, you know, I put a little time into it in the morning. <laughs> and that goes for anything, especially um, all counseling. All counseling is simply meeting with somebody who has simply set their mind on things of the earth for months and has a twisted perspective. And um, all marriage counseling is simply what's wrong with, this, with their spouse. And they've sat there and they've meditated on it for months and then they come into the office and they want to talk about why they don't want to be with somebody anymore and it's like man I, I can tell that you haven't thanked God for, for marriage in a very long time you, you know what I'm saying and so I if this isn't a this isn't a, cu a cute suggestion or a, a sweet devotional sentence it's life and death is is found right here in this first scripture if you've been raised with Christ keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God Set your mind on things above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. This is one of the better benefits of Christianity. Not everyone knows how to or takes a hold of this. Let me tell you this. Um, the, in the same way that you can um, look at something and, and believe that you saw something, but it's not really what took place. Did you guys ever have that happen? Like you, you were looking at something... And uh, I'm trying to think of a good example of that. Um, you were, it, it was dark in, in your house, and as you came down, you began to see a light. Um, and it looked like a light was on, and when you got down, it was like the microwave light, and it wasn't a light that you left on. Or um, did you guys ever wake up in a, in a room that's not typically your room because you're sleeping over somewhere? Because you guys all go to sleepovers. <laughs> or um, <laughs> like you're in a hotel, you know what I mean? And as you wake up and you look around the room, it's not, hey, how you doing? It's not as you are used to. And the clock lights aren't in the right place. You know what I mean? And it appears all of a sudden like everything's messed up. 
the benefit to being crucified with Christ, and being crucified with Christ isn't something that you're trying to do. Being crucified is, with Christ is something that took place because you came to him. You don't come to him as a live man. You come to him as a dead man. And the moment that you receive him in baptism and you go down and you come back up, right, that is the time where it's not just a representation of you dying. The self that you were never created for, the, the selfishness, the, the self that needs to be satisfied, that thing that wants things its own way, that thing that we received when we fall, when we fell dies, okay, whenever you come to Christ. Every, and this is the cool part about it, and this is where nobody takes advantage of this, but I'm telling you, you take advantage of it. Anything that is selfish ambition, anything that is tied to anything negative, now is not you, right? It's not you, but it's the enemy, and it's, it's, that, it's that familiar spirit, it's the, the echo of, of, of thoughts and patterns of thinking in your own mind as things were. But that's currently not who you are now. So in Christianity, this is a huge benefit. I, I never, if I have negative thoughts, I never take responsibility for them and say, oh man, man, look where I'm at, look where I need to grow. And if I say something or do something, that's the first thing I say, is oh, look what I fell for, look what I've been believing, look how I acted or said, I need to repent. But just because I have a thought that's, that's maybe negative or against somebody, I, I, whether it's the enemy or, or, or that old way of thinking, I don't cling to it and put it on and say, this is who I am, I never do that ever again which actually prevents me from doing that kind of stuff. Now I'm still growing and the Holy Spirit's still showing me and, and teaching me to be more careful with my tongue, but it's so great to be dead in Christ and then having been raised and seated with him. It says, For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. I said it's okay to be excited about eternity. It says in 1 John 2, 28, Now little children abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. Did you guys ever read that verse in 1 John? I'm going to read it to you again. It's a sobering verse. I love sobering verses in the Bible. It says, Now little children abide in him. Your role is to abide in him. You're not abiding in him because you said a prayer one day. Your, your whole goal is to abide in his love. Now, how did, how did he, he's already kind of told you what that actually looks like. You keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated. Okay? Now, little children, abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. Now, listen to this verse in John three nineteen through 21. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Okay. There should be this thing called your life that looks different because you are in Christ. Okay? And some people say, well, we don't, we don't have to... Let me say it this way. Let me pull out my scalpel. Well, I'm, I'm just good to go because I'm in Christ, okay? When he appears, light is coming, okay? And in the midst of that light, if you're not that light, you're going to become really aware of what, how dark you are or aren't, okay? Now, in the midst of that light coming, there's, there's an option here that's described in John 3. Some people are going to be terrified of that light and run, and some people are going to come towards the light knowing that their deeds were wrought in God, meaning that their deeds were done in God. And so it's okay to have confidence in your life, to look at your life and see the faith in your own life and say, man, I must really believe something about God here. There is some evidence that I'm different than other people. Not judging other people, not saying, oh, yeah. What I'm talking about is it's, it's okay to have evidence in your life that you are born again and to have confidence in that so that when he comes, listen, let me just read the verse again. It says, when Christ who is our life is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Okay, so I'm not talking about working out um, 
you doing things to be saved. I'm talking about the evidence of being saved are these things in your life that are different. You're no longer like the world, no longer engaged in the things of the world, loving people the way Christ does, and Christ is appearing, and it seems that things that he's shining and showing are things that you have in your life also. Does that make sense? Okay. You're never going to hear anybody talk like that, pretty much on that verse in, uh, maybe, maybe in the 22nd century. People will preach on that verse, but not, not this century. People won't. And the reason why is because it gets, I'll get to it. Anyway, therefore, in the verse number five, therefore consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. In my immaturity, I used to look at this and say, oh, man, that's what I want to do. You know what I mean? As a, as a young kid, I was like, are you saying that I, I can't do the things that I want to do? Talk about somebody who needed to sit down with God for a few days and get his heart fixed. Because I used to re look at that and say, man, I, there are things that are immoral that that's all I want to do is, is be immoral because that's how I'm coping with what I'm believing in my heart about myself. Make sense? What I needed to do was believe God. I needed to sit down with the gospel and actually read the thing. I needed to get alone with him. And ask him to change the desires of my heart. Because the desires of my heart w was immorality. It was the things of the flesh. And those are the things that I desired. Because I hadn't believed the gospel yet. When I say I hadn't believed the gospel yet, I had not received the love of God yet. Nor was I in love with, um, with his work that he had done in my life. So you flip it over. There's that classic proverb, as a man believes in his heart, therefore he is. If you believe you're a mess, you will leave a mess, right? If you, um, man, I, somebody just said this to me the other day. They said, oh, um, for example, my wife said this this morning. She goes, I didn't get any sleep last night. My patience is going to be so thin today. <laughs> And I was, uh, I said, well, what if, I said, what if your patience is actually unending today, you, you know? Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is Christ, Christ didn't get much sleep. He seemed to have a lot of patience. Because he, he, he would stay up through the night interceding on behalf of us and hanging out with his dad um, so he could be there for people. But sleep didn't really seem to affect him all very much. Although he did sleep on the boat when the storm was there, so he's tired. <laughs> um, all right. For it is on account of these things. What things? Uh, immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, and amounts to idolatry. For it is on account of these things that the wrath of God will come. Eighteen times the wrath of God is mentioned in the New Testament. And let me just say this about the wrath of God, because um, that's something else that you're never going to hear anybody talk about this century. The, the, the <laughs> wrath of God is something that you were saved from. Okay? Probably the most important thing that you were saved from, not only were you saved from yourself, not only were you saved from uh, the enemy's camp, right, and the destruction of it, and the way of it, and the living of it, and not only were you purified and holy and set apart, but like Sodom and Gomorrah, please hear me on this, you can't get away from this scripturally. Like Sodom and Gomorrah, what was Lot saved from? He was saved from a lot of things in Sodom and Gomorrah, but the last thing he was saved from was the oh. wrath of God, right? Because at the end of it, and I describe it like this to people, if my, if my, um, at the, at the end of the day, the Bible talks about the, uh, the enemies of God and those, those who refuse to recognize him as God. And let me just reinstate who God is. God is actually king and he's actually in charge and he is the one at the end of the day who we were created through, by, and for. And so there, there is this, this way of the kingdom in which if you were created by him and for him and through him, there's a certain degree of honor that is given back to God for what he has done. Now, literally, let's think about this as like a kingdom, as in like um, 15th century, like England, like an actual kingdom. There's a king that's in a kingdom, and he is the one who rules the land. Now, he doesn't control people, and neither does God, right? Mm -hmm. But he is the one who is in charge. And if you want to have anarchy, 
and decide that king is not the king of my life. He is saying this, that one day there will come a day when all men will be judged. Now this is amazing. We've all offended God and to the umph degree. I mean, I lived for myself. I did things that I wanted to do. I hurt his kids, right? And he has forgiven me and pardoned me. And not only forgave me and pardoned me as if I came into the great hall and he said pardoned, but he actually went to great lengths to pardon me, hence his son dying on my behalf. Now, if my son gave up his uh, one of his kidneys so that you could live, um, what, inf what, what, what makes a kidney go bad? Anybody know? Does it? Yeah. We're, we're a highly educated bunch of them. I've been here. Um, let me just say the liver. I'll just, let's just say the liver. Let's say uh, my son decided to give you his liver, right, so that you could live. And you're, and you're going back to, to um, drinking a, a fifth of, of vodka every night, not considering his sacrifice to save your life. Now the wrath of God starts to make sense a little bit. Because it's, it's, not, it's not that he's upset that you're breaking his laws, although he is. It's that you did not consider his own son anything to anything as worthy, anything to receive, not a big deal in your life. It's his son who died on your behalf, and you don't care. And it means nothing to you. You guys get what I'm saying? So when I read the wrath of God in, in the Bible, I don't say, oh God, I got, I'm glad that's not really in there. It actually says, for on account of these things, the wrath of God will come. Now thank God we live in this time of grace where all men are invited to come to God. And what I, what I once heard was, um, somebody said, in one hand, Jesus is reaching out to you saying, come, and it's the will of the Father that every man be saved, right? And with the other arm, he is keeping back the wrath of the Father upon the judgment of the earth. And the man said, one day these two hands will both drop, you know, and there will no, no longer be a chance to come, and the wrath of God will come upon those who did not receive his son. And it's not that people are innocent. We've all been tried and found guilty. Guilty that we want what we want not recognizing, Romans 1 talks about not honoring him. We're giving thanks upon the God who's given us everything. Does that make sense? Okay, I don't want to skim over words like that. It's a, um, it's a big thing. And, and Jesus, how many of you guys know that Jesus represented love? And he warned people of the wrath of God. Every time he met those Pharisees, out of love he warned them. That was just as loving as it was feeding the people. Because how many of you guys know, like, one day you'll love people enough to warn them? That's, that's a sign of maturity, is that we would actually warn people of the wrath to come, you know, and that we would actually intercede and pray for and speak up and say, hey, like, I'm not, like, I'm not doing it in a wrath-filled way and angry and I'm like, oh, the wrath's coming. Like that, what I'm saying is, is that there, if there's a car coming to hit my kid, it'd be nice if I were to eventually tell him that, Right? And it's actually very cool. It's probably very hating, and not hating. That's not the right word. It's a. Um, it's probably the most um, hate-filled act is silence when it comes to a car that's about to hit somebody. I don't think you can get more hateful than that. You guys get what I'm saying? Now I know it's like eight fifty a.m., but that, that, that's a uh, a great conversation to have, and it's it's okay to to. To warn people. The reason why we don't like to warn people is because we don't like to think that like we're mightier than thou and that we're on some sort of solid rock away from the danger. But that's exactly what we are. And we're pleading with men, come join us. Like come come be on this rock. And and don't don't get caught up in that storm that's gonna come onto everyone's work one day. And I think the one the one thing, um, how many of you guys, let me just say this. Um did you guys, did anybody listen to the video last night that I sent out? Anybody? It's, it, it talked about how um, he was saying the joy of the Lord is the will, being able to do the will of the Lord. And my joy I le leave with you, and my peace I leave with you, and what is that, the ability to actually do the will of the Lord? A lot of us, um, I, I think sometimes are waiting for God to promote us, but we're unwilling to uh, say the hard thing when it comes down to it. Um, I, I used to be afraid to say the hard thing. Now, like, the, as soon as somebody walks in the door, I'm telling them the hard thing and the hard reality of things because for them, I actually became more loving. That's why I'm able to, to do that now. 
Um, let's keep reading. And it says this, and in them you once walked when you were living in them. Paul and John aren't afraid to bring up the fact of where you were at one point. Okay? Now he says, don't, don't, get, don't get focused on those things from behind. But once in a while, did you, ever, did you ever read Paul? He says, hey, you remember when you were outside of this covenant and you were just like the Gentiles? His whole point is, is um, and we don't, we don't really appreciate this very much, um, I know what I was before Christ, and I know that I, who I am now in Christ, and that, that separation is huge. People, people probably for the last 50 years, um, we don't tell people to repent of their sins. We don't tell them that they sin because we don't want them to feel bad about themselves. You, you know what I'm saying? So their repentance is a, they're not even actually repenting. We say, do you want to receive Christ? That wasn't part of the formula. It was repent and believe was the formula. And so um, people don't understand what they've been forgiven of. And they feel like it was a $5 debt instead of the million dollar debt. Meanwhile, where, where was the key to loving more? It was an understanding the gap that you were forgiven. And so people wonder why, why isn't the church more loving? It's because people don't understand the debt they were forgiven. Because it's not preached that way, and, and repentance actually looks like something. It actually means grasping what I was actually forgiven of. And not only am I forgiven of something, but who I am now in the Lord. And, and uh, the stretch that there is, 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 is your gratitude and what you actually appreciate from God. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, it says, but now... You also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Why? Because it's possible now in Christ to still screw up. And Paul is saying, listen, part of the reason why he's writing this letter is because um, some of them are actually screwing up. And he wants them to know the reason why he wrote chapter 1 and chapter 2 is that it's possible not to screw up. Not by trying hard, but by believing who Christ is and what he's done and, and who they are now in him. And he's pointing this out to them. Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. And that's kind of the, he's always going back to the, to the idea that the old self was crucified. You've forgotten. John puts it this way. Um, he says that, uh, that the reason why you keep messing up, this is my paraphrase, is because you've forgotten that your sins are forgiven. That's it. I think that's beautiful. If you talk to anybody who's in danger of really screwing up their lives in sin, it's because they lost perspective of what they've been forgiven. I can promise you within the last 24 hours, they haven't raised their hand and said, God, I thank you that, that my sins are forgiven and that Jesus Christ came and died on my behalf. You're awesome. That's a, that's a promise. Here he goes again. And have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Isn't that good? Because it's possible. It's actually possible to put on the new self and be renewed in your knowledge. That's what gets me so excited about Scripture. Everything that Scripture says is possible through faith and believing it. So just going back and looking at this, so I, I was to say this, but now you also um, put them all, as, all, all aside, anger, wrath, malice, and you find that you're angry and you're upset, right? There, or if you find that your um, your your speech isn't blessing people, okay, you can get along with God and say, "Hey, God, in uh, in Colossians three eight, it says to put this stuff aside." That means it's actually possible to do that. And I know I just messed up back there, but there's a place in you that I want in my heart where I don't I don't do that anymore, and it's possible because of that verse. Will you help me put them aside? Will you show me what that looks like? And if, like, if your kid came up to you and said that, you would fall over dead. <laughs> you know? It would be like, what kind, like, those are the type of prayers that Jesus is just waiting to just kick open the door on. You know? I'm still living. My son hasn't done that yet. He hasn't come in. <laughs> Father, will you help me put aside an abusive speech? <laughs> what? Does that make a look? Um, in verse 11, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and freeman, but Christ is all and in all. Now, the reason why, like, we come from a society that, like, puts everybody on an equal playing field as part of our culture, 
and uh, they did it, so that was pretty mind blowing right there. But it was also mind blowing that, that these that these men actually could be the things that he's talking about. And so, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, oh my gosh, this is possible too. Put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a, has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. And beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which you indeed were called in one body, and be thankful. Again, I put because it's possible. Um, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing that, that we could actually put those things on. Not that we're trying to, not that we're trying to do them. Um, I don't know if you can try and do them in the end. I think it's only through being with God does God give you that faith to believe what he has said, if that's what you're asking for, and that you begin to see them in your life. Let the word of God richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your heart to God. So we should be armed with what the Lord is saying and unique expressions of God in our lives. There's a... Um, this is... It's actually possible to do this, and I'll put it this way. In every interaction that you have with every person, it's actually possible to know where that person is at and be able to say what it is that God wants to say. Okay, let me say that again. And I just had this conversation with Brian about prophecy the other day. <clears throat> and what I was saying was this. I said, you know, <clears throat> I believe that we have a twisted view of the the prophetic or the encouraging words because of self-esteem. Um, if I said to you, uh, really like your jacket there, that's, you know, hey, well, thank you. You know, you know what I mean? It's, it's, not a, it's not a, wow, like I really like what you're doing with your build. You know, as I, as I look at you, you look like you're in great shape and everything, you look really good today. You know what I mean? That's not the prophetic, okay? That is, that's flattery, okay? Now, we don't mind flattery. But the, what I believe the, the true prophetic is simply is you're in a relationship with God and you're trying your best to hear from God and discern what he's saying and I'm coming up to you echoing what he's saying. Does that make sense? So I'm actually affirming what it is that you're hearing from the Lord. And, I, and I'm there and I'm a, a becoming a piece of that puzzle that you're trying to put together of what the Lord is saying. And there's nothing more... Um, awesome than somebody out of the blue affirming what it is that you believe that God is saying to you. Um, especially even when it deals with like the word and, and somebody comes up to you and says, man, I just, I, I, it's cool anyway, like whatever they say, but it's really cool whenever they're, they're, they press in on the same scripture that God's been pressing in on. I think that's just wonderful. And it's actually to, to maintain that awareness and it is an awareness problem. I also believe it's an intentionality problem. Um, that when you interact with people, that you have the ability in Christ to know exactly where they're at with the Lord and what it is that, that God wants to say to them. I think that's powerful. To have a culture of that would be uh, <coughs> awesome. So in verse 17, it says, And whatever you do, in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks for him to the God the Father. That's pretty intense that it says all. So whatever you do in word or deed, do all, giving thanks for him to, to God the Father. And then in, uh, I believe it's Thessalonians, it says, the will of the Lord is that you would give thanks always, that you would always maintain a thankful heart. And that's the will of the Lord in your life, is that you'd maintain gratitude, because if you maintain that gratitude, you actually are, in reality, in heaven. Okay, I'm going to say it again. Remember how he said, set your mind on things above? The indicator that you actually are setting your mind on things above is the reality that you are thankful at every moment, no matter what. Rejoice always, give thanks always, pray always. There, there's a, there's a, the, the, how you know that you are is that if I were to take a picture of you, is that in that picture, you, I could tell that you're a thankful person. That's how you know that your mind is actually set on things above. 
is because now you're actually living in the reality that all things have been created for him, by him, and through him, is that you have a thankful heart. Does that make sense? And I said, this is, this is maturity that the flesh is gone. The flesh is never thankful because the flesh never gets enough. Okay, you guys ever, you guys ever live in the flesh? <coughs> the, the flesh will never be content and will never be satisfied. And when Jesus talks about, um, come to me all you who are thirsty and drink, they're actually supposed to, in Christ, I understand hunger, and I'm not talking about the concept of hungering for God. I'm talking about the concept of receiving God and being with God and eating your daily bread, which is the Word of God. There should be some sort of satisfaction that takes place in relationship with God. Not that you would grow satisfied and that not pursue Him, but that you would receive from Him these words that He has and actually be satisfied in that moment, at least for that day that you've heard from the Lord and that you have a relationship with God. Um, this, this word, giving thanks, it's also, um, it's Eucharistio, and thank goodness nobody's corrected me on my Greek pronunciations or my English ones. Um, it means to be thankful, but does anybody see what Greek word is right in the middle there? Anybody see it? What? Well, there's a Eucharist there, which is, yeah, this is like a huge word puzzle. Grace. What? Charis. Charis, grace, yeah. Grace is right in the middle of that. Um, and the usage on that is uh, giving thanks. It's giving thanks. I don't know why I put giving thanks on there so many times. Just so not confused. It means to give thanks. And so um, there's a grace in the, in, in the midst of the word can also is sometimes translated grateful. So there's a, a, a grace in the midst of being grateful. And I actually think that being grateful and being, and being thankful is actually how you receive more grace from God. When I say more grace, I mean his transforming power to actually look more like him, act more like him, be more like him. It's because you are, if you're, to put it this way as an analogy, you turn into his frequency, it's a frequency of thanksgiving. And so by being thankful, by setting your things, mind on things above, you actually become more like him and are able to receive more grace from him. To look more like him. That's why um, Paul is saying, go to go back to the very beginning of chapter 3, he is saying, set your mind on things above. Why? Because the report that he got about them isn't, hey guys, stop doing what you're doing. It's bad. Although he could say that. He's saying, see, the, the real issue here is you guys aren't setting your mind on things above and you're not thankful. Therefore, you're not becoming like him because you're not tuned into the same frequency he is. Hence, why you're acting like you never met him in the first place. Because it has everything to do with that you haven't become thankful in your hearts. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, rules for Christian households. Um, that's a good title. It says, Wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Now, the, the way these things are, um, fathers do not exasperate your children that they may not lose heart. I don't mind um, the Bible giving me orders. Okay, uh, our, our, our culture has issue with that. And don't tell me what to do. You don't know what my wife is like. You don't know what my husband's like, blah, 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 blah. I would prefer orders from the Lord. That way I can just clearly know if I'm doing his will or not. You know, because the most important thing, as you can see down here as he says it, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. What are the orders for is to please the Lord? Or is it to get what you want or to have it your way? Or, you know, you get what I'm saying. Or is it so that you can even, in the flesh, be happy? It has nothing to do with that. If your heart is seeking the things above, what do you think you're going to want to do? Please the Lord, Right? And he says, hey, would anybody like to please the Lord? Let me tell you how to do it. There it is. And so I think that's awesome. Now, what I think is even better than awesome is it says, um, the Bible tells my wife what to do, and the Bible tells me what to do, and I am in no way um, uh, responsible 
for my wife's response to whether or not she wants to do this. Isn't that cool? And her response of how she treats me in no way affects me and my heart because I've set my minds on things above, not on things below. So my wife doesn't dictate how I'm doing. Like I don't go home and say, man, I wish my wife would subject to me more. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Because it doesn't matter whether or not she does, I have my orders from my king and who I'm interested in being well-pleasing to. You know? So at the end of the day, I have full freedom in Christ to please him or not. And there's a lot of freedom there. And so I, I, I more than appreciate my wife and thank God for my wife. And she's a lovely woman, but at the end of the day, I'm not responsible for her doing her role in this thing. And there's a lot of freedom in that. If I was, that'd be a nightmare. If I actually had to take some sort of responsibility to make sure that my wife treated me in a certain way, that's where people get really screwed up, is whenever they believe that they're responsible or in charge of or somehow have to get their spouse to act in a certain way, and then they resort to psychological ways of uh, positive and negative reinforcement. You, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, well, if you don't do this, then I'm not doing this, or those are your dishes, and you know, I'm not going to clean them. You need to figure that out. You know, and so we're, we're trying to get our spouses to act in a certain way, thinking that that's going to satisfy what the flesh that can't be satisfied. So if you're looking to be satisfied through the 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 this is so um, true. Your spouse cannot satisfy you in the way that you are now created, because you are created to eat the bread that's from above. In no way can your spouse become the bread that's from above. Okay, only God can do that. But the flesh desires to be treated in a certain way, but the flesh is never satisfied. So even if your spouse, even if your spouse was to treat you like gold and literally just like kiss your feet when you came, mwah, 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 mwah. <laughs> but, oh, I can't believe I'm married to you. You're so wonderful. Mwah, 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 mwah. It wouldn't matter at the end of the day, you would still find something that would irritate you or some way that they missed the mark. And that would become a big deal. And Satan would make sure it became a big deal in your heart. Because, you know, they, you, know they, you come home, they kiss your feet, they give you a foot massage, they make your favorite meal, they do this and they do that. And at the end of the day, they left their towel on the floor. And after, after your, your, your kiss-covered feet, walk into the bathroom, you pick up the floor, you turn around and say, what is this? When are you going to get it right? I can't believe I'm married to you. Because the flesh is never satisfied. It never will be. <coughs> ah, and I'm so glad let me just say this I'm not boasting I'm just thankful I am so glad that I've woken up from that stuff I am so glad that I'm not here on the earth looking towards my spouse saying I'm going to wait to see how I'm doing today based on how she treats me this morning let's find out she didn't treat me very nice I'm I can't even pretend. It's just, <laughs> it's just, it's, it's, in, it's when, now that I've been enlightened by Christ and his wisdom, it, it made sense at one point in my life where I was trying to have some sort of need met, but I realized that my needs cannot be met by a person. They can only be met by God. And that's because I'm supposed to be eating his words daily, right? It cracks me up. Anyway. Uh, Slaves, in all things, obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. I love this verse. Um, if you guys, you guys ever, uh, oh gosh, I forget his name. He's a famous atheist, Bill Maher. He says that the Bible promotes slavery. Okay? Um, back then, slavery was a, was a form of debt. We have credit cards today. They didn't have credit cards, and it was actually a very... Um, economical way, it actually helps society. <coughs> Here you have somebody, they can't, they can no longer um, sustain themselves, and instead of starving to death, they sell themselves into slavery, and they go into slavery. And there, they're fed, they work, they, you know, they work, you know, 10 hours a day, they're still with their families, and they live in this little house on someone else's property, and uh, now, the masters back then, they weren't, um, what we had, the Bible commands Christian masters to treat their slaves well, right? And so I don't know how all the masters treated them. I'm sure they were all different.
but it was a it was a form of not dying slavery and it was actually rather healthy in those cultures and the people who were begging were those who couldn't become slaves so when you see beggars did you ever see um, uh, people asking for money today it's not that they're invalids it's not that they're sitting there blind and they, they can't do anything it, you don't know if they can have a job or not. You're just unsure. You don't know if they're making more money than you are. You just have no idea. You, you know, Back in that day, the people who were asking for money had no means. They couldn't sell themselves into slavery. And so, uh, listen to this. It says, slaves and all things, obey those who are your masters on earth. Now, there's other parts in the Bible where it says, slaves, no matter how your masters treat you, treat them well and work well, right? And I think it's such an emphasis on that because... Uh, and, and please hear me on this. We can all learn this lesson. If you work for somebody who doesn't deserve being worked for, the Bible commands you to be diligent in all that you do underneath them. Right? He's telling slaves, for masters who are harsh, work hard for. We don't have any excuse not to bust our butts at work as Christians. You know, if he's telling slaves, if your masters mistreat you, don't count it against them. You work hard for them. We don't have any excuses um, not to do our best in whatever sort of things we're in. But this is why. On earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Because this is what God will say, oftentimes. He'll put it this way. Hey, listen, pretend the master, even though he's not treating you the way I would, pretend he's me. Serve him as if he's me. Hey, wives, do it unto me. Your husbands might, might not be treating you the way I would, but you know what? You, why don't you go ahead and pay me back and pretend that they're he says the same things to, to the husbands. He says, hey, husbands, uh, go ahead and treat them as I treated the church and lay, lay yourself down for them. Why don't you do it for me? If they don't deserve it in, in your immaturity and you can't see them for who they actually are, why don't you go ahead and just pretend they're me and treat them as such? <coughs> Isn't that just bold? That's why marriage counseling is so short. It's just, <laughs> boom, do you believe the Bible or not? Okay. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather for men knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. That's interesting. Again, for those of us who, who have jobs, or even those who are at home keeping the house, it is for Christ whom you serve. That's who you're serving in everything that you do. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done and that without partiality. Well, that's just intense. And I and I didn't go into any kind of long explanation there. Um, I just said, what would this look like? And I, I, I'm actually going to do more research on that and, and try to figure out what that actually says next week. And that's, that's the verse we'll start from. Does anybody have any questions from anything we covered? Yes? The only um, one thing that came up is when... When the Bible talks about the wrath of God, does it is he talking? Are they talking about basically the judgment of God and what God feels needs to happen? Would you yeah. say that that would be the wrath? There was, there's no one specific thing. It's just mm -hmm. basically the judgment of God and what He feels should happen. Yeah. Okay. If you guys want, if you guys want to, there, you can just do a um, go on the computer and uh, type up the wrath of God, all verses in the New Testament, and and look at it. And this is how you do a word study, and it's rather interesting. Pretend that you don't know what the word wrath means at all, okay? And just go up and um, put the wrath of God in, in quotations. And then begin to put the context that it's in. And then just begin to look at the context of what it is. And as you begin to look at the context of what it is, let it reform what it actually is because it's been mis misinterpreted. And what I mean, it's been misinterpreted on both sides. Because you have two camps. There's always like, I always tell people like, truth is more of like a, a drawbridge, not a drawbridge, it's more of like a tightrope than it is a cliff <coughs> that you can fall off of. And what I mean by that is, is that there's usually two sides of the truth that you can fall off of. And some people um, end up saying the wrath of God is this, and some people end up dismissing the wrath of God. I don't care what either side says. I want to know what the Bible says about it. And I want to make sure that I am, whatever it says, I want to make sure that I've, embodied that understanding and am li living according to that understanding. And so anytime you come across any sort of phrase, don't, don't depend, because this is, this is the, the worst part, is that people, uh, we're supposed to show ourselves um, 
approved and well studied. I think I, I chopped that up a bit, but um, <laughs> we're supposed to show ourselves approved and well studied. Meanwhile, uh, we're depending on the interpretation of man instead of going to the Word and going to the Holy Spirit and asking. So I want to know what the Holy Spirit has to say about the wrath of God. I want to know what it looks like my, my role and responsibility is in the wrath of God. And I want to know, um, in the same way that, that Jesus warned and, and John warned, and um, even, even the book of Revelations. Do you know what it says about the book of Revelations? It says, uh, there's a promise in Revelations. It says that, um, and I again, forgive me for, I'm, not, I'm no Brian Cohen when it comes to clean scripture. Um, in Revelations 1, it says, uh, it talks about there's wisdom in that book. Right, and and I want to understand the wisdom that's in Revelations. I don't want to become uh, lose my perspective of today and what I'm supposed to do today because of Revelations. I really want to understand what what it's going to look like because if all men are supposed to come to Him, I do understand that we live in in this period of grace right now. But one day that judgment is going to come, and it's it appears that there's two of them. And the first one, it just seems like the trap door drops out on on half the people that are involved, you know, and um, and I there's still I still have I still have questions about it. I still I've I've asked God about hell and and the different aspects of it. I'm done reading books on it. I'm done um, trying to understand what people are saying about it. I want to hear from Him on it, you know, and. Uh, I really want to. I really want to know because it's something that he talked about, and there's. I believe there's a maturity in it that I, that I want to be that I want to be prepared for. Also, I'm going to be held responsible to some degree to warn people about that. What I mean by this is, is I've I've been in um, I've been in situations in counseling where I've just flat out told people, do you know why I'm never going to go through with what you're talking about? Because I'm going to be standing before God one day giving an account for my life. And I'm never going to have him look at me and say, you were a son of disobedience. I'm never going to fool myself into thinking I was Christian. Meanwhile, I did what I wanted to at every turn and tried to get what I wanted out of life, listened to certain preachers who agreed with what I was thinking and what my flesh wanted, and I walked through this life as a son of disobedience, disregarding who God was so that I could have it my way, get to the end of the road and have him say, I never knew you. Uh-uh, I'm not doing that. I'm actually going to pursue him. I'm actually going to figure out what he says. I don't care what my tickling ears want to hear. I want to know what he's saying. Yeah, does that make sense? And so I think I think doing your own uh, word study on that would be an awesome idea. You know, I think it's how many times is it in there? Eighteen. Yeah, I think four of them are in the uh, are, in, are in Revelations, and Paul mentions it quite often. So just look at what he has to say about it. All right. Anything else? Just the concept of you know you can see it laid out there because the K knowing him and knowing who you are in him mm -hmm. really it's there and then being aware of the old nature and the new nature and focusing yeah. and being intentional about being that new nature and not the old creation or yeah, the old one and then the obedience and doing what he's calling you to do he's actually given us the orders right there mm -hmm. you know he makes it that's what's great about God it's not a yeah. secret and he's like this is what you need to do and we just have the choice to do it yeah. or not. I'm going to turn in Kai, the Kaido book to see if I can get it canonized and put in at the uh, <laughs> See if we can't put it in at, right before Revelations there. Can get it. Just joking. I'm just joking. Anything else? Well, you guys were a lively group. <laughs> Bible study Bible study is uh, um, I'm going to try to do it Next week, there's got to be there's got to be a better way of just than just it's got to be more engaging, I believe, than uh, than this format. So I'm gonna try to make it more engaging. All right, any other questions? Not comments, but questions. Jen. No, I'm joking. Anything else? All right, let's close in uh, prayer. Um, someone like to pray? Close us out. It's got to be really good though. Offer. There you go. Thank you. 
Father God, we just thank you and we praise you that we could come here this morning, that we could be enlightened by your word, Father God. And so we ask as we leave here that that word that which was that which we heard about today will penetrate into our hearts and will transform our mind so that we can go out into this world and do the work that your son Jesus taught us to do. In his name, Father, we thank you and we praise you. Amen. 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 All right, bless you guys. Thank you.